Hi, AC2020. I'm Jordan Hinkle. I'm a fourth year graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm here today to tell you about some fun work I did in the mining from DevOps artifacts space. I did this work last summer at Microsoft Research Redmond with my colleagues Chris Bird and Shabindu Lahiri and my advisor Tom Reps. So I want to kick things off by just defining DevOps. What is DevOps? Well, it's a blend of the words development and operations, and it's easy for me to just think of this as an ecosystem of tools. Uh, these are tools you might have heard of before, like Docker and Kubernetes, but there are so, so many more. And these tools exist to help developers meet operational goals like continuous integration and testing, um, managing cloud infrastructure, running containers and services, stuff like that. Something of interest for us today is the fact that a lot of these tools take, take some form of structured input. Uh, these structured input files, they usually live in the repository for the projects, they live alongside code. Um, they're richly complex, they need to be maintained, and ideally they need to kind of exist in a good state. And for us today, I'm going to refer to the inputs to these various tools as DevOps artifacts. And in particular for this work, we focused on Docker. Although across the spectrum of DevOps tools that we looked at, we found that about a quarter of the repositories we analyzed had some form of DevOps artifact. Uh, but to keep things focused, we're just looking at Docker files. The techniques will be general, uh, but the experiments that we carry out in the discussion in this talk will be focused on Docker specifically and Docker files. So what's the problem? Well, to me, the problem is this. When I open up VS Code in an interactive development environment and I start editing a TypeScript file, let's say, I get really good semantic square support, I get IntelliSense, I get type hints, I get um, basic checking of what I'm writing, I get the squigglies that tell me when I've done something possibly wrong, but when I open a Docker file, I get basic syntax highlighting and, and that's pretty much it, right? Some regular expression-based validation, essentially. And this divide between popular programming languages and DevOps artifacts is sad, especially since the plugin for Docker it has somewhere around two or three unique, uh, two or three million unique installations. So that's a lot of people using it, uh, but the support is nowhere near the level of the support we have for popular programming languages. So you could ask, why aren't we doing more for DevOps? If this is a popular ecosystem with a lot of tools that have decent adoption, these are things that people need to edit and maintain, why don't we have better support? And I think the answer here is that we could, um, but these DevOps tools, they're, they're rapidly evolving. It's kind of a new-ish ecosystem, right? It hasn't been a long, around for ages and ages, so it's still moving at a fast pace. And that makes this kind of a high risk and low reward situation. You could invest a lot of time in making some good semantics aware support, only to have in the next five years a new tool show up that's even better, that, that does better container management, has a different input format, uh, and invalidates all that hard work you did. So for this paper and for this talk, we have kind of a core goal, and that's inspired by the growing amount of work in the learning rules from code to check code, things like learning rules for simple linters and AST-based checkers. And our goal here is just to, to apply this paradigm to DevOps, right? It would be really great if we could take a bunch of DevOps artifacts and learn rules from those automatically. It's especially great because we're in this place where we don't want to invest a lot of time in writing these rules. And things are rapidly evolving. There's new tools all the time. So if we could just learn them, we'd be in a really good spot to provide better support to developers to enhance the quality of these artifacts without investing too much ourselves. Of course, this sounds wonderful, but there are some challenges to doing such a thing. The first of which is heavy use of nested languages. And I'll, I'll talk more about this on the next slide, but I hope intuitively it makes sense why we might see so many nested languages with DevOps stuff. In general, for DevOps, you know, we have things that are orchestrating things or managing things or setting up environments. So hopefully you can see how there might be a top level and then some embedded scripts and, and so on and so forth. We also need a, an analysis engine and a rule encoding and all of that good stuff. Um, check out the paper for details on that. At a really high level, we use tree association rules. We write an analysis engine that takes those as input and checks them against source files. Uh, that's also the format of the rules we can end up mining automatically, uh, but all the details there are in the paper. So concretely, I just wanna show an actual example of a Docker file here. And I wanna draw a parallel to just help build intu intuition to make files. Um, make files, you know, there's targets and within a target you kind of do arbitrary stuff. With Docker files, there are these directives. It's a linear sequence of directives, the from, copy, run, and purple there. And then within these directives, some of them, like run, have embedded bash. And this embedded bash does more things and kind of goes down the line of embedded languages, setting up a image to run containers from. Uh, but those are all implementation details. Really, for this talk, what we need to know is that this Docker file is clearly full of a lot of nested languages. In particular, there's the top level language, there's the embedded bash, then things like run commands. And then within the bash, you invoke things like app get or curl or wget, and these have their own options languages and feature flags and stuff. So if you look at these artifacts and you try to ask where are mistakes being made, you'll find that they end up in kind of the lowest tier of embedded languages. They end up all the way down there. And in particular, for Docker files, it's the subtle differences between how you might use bash at the command line interactively 
and how you need to use it in this static artifact that you build other things from uh, that lead to a lot of simple mistakes that we would like to catch. So hopefully this situates us in a position where you can see a Docker file and you can see the nested languages within it, and you can see how we really need to understand all those languages so that we can have any hope of doing automated mining or providing good static checking or stuff like that. So how do we deal with the nested languages? Well, we have a technique called phase parsing and it does the direct thing. Um, if you start with just a Docker file and you do a top level parse, you'll get something like what I have on the screen right now. This is a pretty shallow tree and it'll have a lot of leaf nodes where there's a big string literal that is often embedded bash. And there's further structure there. I call these effectively uninterpretable. There's, there's more stuff we could do, but if we stopped here, we really can't do much aside from fuzzy matching. So we do the direct thing, we invoke a bash parser where we think there's embedded bash, we get subtrees, and then oddly enough, we've made the situation worse in a lot of cases, because now again, we have more of these effectively uninterpretable leaves, and this time they come from a lot of different sub-languages. So here, this one is an app get install that has its own flags, its own argument format, it's different than make dir or wget or tar, so we'll have to deal with that. And that's where things start to get interesting, when we get to this second level, when we have the bash, and we want to do a third level parse, we're going to need to handle all these different kinds of utilities that people will use uh, within Docker files. So this, these are things like git, wget, we need to handle all of them. Uh, but you know, we can make a trade-off here. We can say, well, let's just do the most popular. And that's exactly what we do. We also need a way to make this not too onerous. And we note that a lot of the popular utilities have embedded help. So we wrote a parser generator that takes a schema that looks like embedded help and generates parsers for these third level commands for things like app get, and w get, and curl, and so on. And if you use our parser generator, as we do, you can start getting these deeper parses within these trees. And you can end up with something like this picture where you parse the Docker file, you parse the bash within, you parse these third level nested languages, and now you have what I call a really good abstract syntax tree for Docker files, and that's nice. So, of course, we did some experiments. Um, in an evaluation of this phase parsing, it does what you would hope it would do. At the first phase, there's a lot of effectively uninterpretable interpretable nodes in these Docker files. When you parse the embedded bash, as I mentioned, things actually get worse. And then when you invoke these 50 generated third level parsers, things get a whole lot better, which is nice. And then of course, since we have good representations, we can do mining and checking. Uh, so for mining, we recover something like two thirds of a round true set of rules automatically. We also find 16 new rules, which is pretty cool, and the details are in the paper. And then for checking, we find a 33% mean violation rate for this set of brown truth rules across all the Docker files in our corpus. And that's five times worse compared to the same violation rate calculation done on Docker files written by experts. So that gap is precisely what we want to address with tools like the one I presented here today. Uh, hopefully by learning rules and applying them, we can make the quality of Docker files you might find kind of in the wild on GitHub closer to those written by experts. That would be ideal. Anyway, I want to thank you for listening. Um, definitely check out the paper, check out our corresponding data showcase paper, and check out the artifacts, and have a great day.